Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the third We Were There. This series was created so that individuals who worked on CDC investigations can share their insights and lessons learned so that others may be inspired to carry on their work. This session is about preventing birth defects, folic acid, and working in China. Before we get started, I'd like to invite Dr. Frieden up to give a few words. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank the speakers and organizers for doing this. I'm very much looking forward to hearing about it myself. It's one of the great successes of public health. As with many things, uh, it's not finished. There's more work to be done. But there's tremendous progress been made. And it's always important to both celebrate that and learn from it. How is it done? And what are the implications for now? To understand the story of folic acid and neural tube defect prevention, we need to go back further in history to another well-known case of birth defects. In the 1950s, late 1950s, phocomelia, a rare birth defect, was associated with thalidomide, which had been in use in Europe and then came to the US as a medication that was supposed to be helpful in pregnancy. That sensitized people to the great risk that the fetal development period entails and understanding, which we're still developing now, uh, how much of our health status is determined by prenatal influences. Before that point, it had been widely believed that there was really no impact on the fetus of uh, maternal exposures. We now know that this is a, a very, very crucial time, as is the early infancy and childhood period. In 1967, CDC established population-based birth defect surveillance here in Atlanta and worked with public health colleagues around the world to establish surveillance systems and share knowledge. And you'll hear about one of those, a very important project in China. Uh, CDC scientists, colleagues in China, and families uh, provided key information. And I will say that over the past decades, for our growing collaboration with China, we've often looked back to that seminal work as an inspiration for further work together and more progress together. And we, in fact, work very closely with the China CDC and other entities in China on a whole range of health problems, uh, both within China and increasingly around the world as well. So that cooperation was important not only for the specific work on folic acid and birth defects and increasing capacity within the Chinese system, but also to establish a very important relationship. CDC scientists also work with other countries to increase their awareness of uh, birth defects and the importance of birth defect surveillance. And of course, uh, with the Zika epidemic, we now have, the, for the first time in five decades, uh, a new cause of uh, a microbially caused severe birth defect. And we're literally learning more about Zika every day. Uh, we have information that will come out in the near future that will help uh, identify what the relative risk is, but there's a great deal we still don't know. Why do some women who are infected give birth to affected children and others not? Uh, whether the children who have normal head size will have neurological problems later in life, and optimal means to prevent, and what fundamentally is causing it. So there's a lot of work to be done still on birth defects and birth defect surveillance. Uh, I would like to uh, emphasize that uh, there's a great deal more that still needs to be done in this and in other areas. Um, the scientists that have collaborated with us on Zika have been uh, trained by the birth defect surveillance program and are growing birth defect surveillance. CDC and our partners have been integral to the understanding of Zika and other birth defects. And this is just an example of how work in one area can be helpful to others. So I want to thank uh, the presenters today for their incredibly important work and for their willingness to share their insights. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frieden. And now for a short video. Folic acid is a vitamin which can protect a developing baby from getting a serious problem that can cause uh, difficulties walking. Spina bifida, anencephaly, 
Uh, these are major birth defects that um, are either fatal or have serious long-term consequences for the child. And in contrast to polio, where you only get motor, you only lose motor function, with spina bifida you lose both motor function and sensory function. We estimate that about 300,000 babies are affected by neural tube defects around the world. Dave and Godfrey Oakley invited me to come to CDC to work on the Vietnam Veterans Agent Orange Risk Study for Birth Defects. And we analyzed that data and published it. It was one of the first population-based studies that was done to show that uh, folic acid in a multivitamin could reduce the risk of neural tube defects. And it was enough to prompt us to figure out whether this was really an idea worth uh, promoting on a public health scale or whether it was something that was just a fluke. June the 24th at 5 p.m. in uh, 1991 was probably the most marvelous uh, professional moment of my life when I got a call from now Sir Nicholas Wall telling me that the randomized control trial that he had done to find out if folic acid or a different vitamin would prevent spina bifida, it had turned out to be such a positive study to prevent 72% of spina bifida and anencephaly and it was in the gold standard study that we called a randomized controlled trial. And it meant that we could bet the farm that folic acid prevented spina bifida. So you're doing something that prevents diseases and prevents conditions with the result of not only saving children's lives, but improving their quality of life. So the first thing we did was make a recommendation for women who had previously had an affected child with either anencephaly or spina bifida, these two very severe birth defects. And that was one of the easiest policy things I ever did at CDC. This was a special recommendation because it called for what we now call a high dose of folic acid, a pharmacological dose of folic acid. If you can prevent something like this, um, especially um, on the scale of preventing thousands of these birth defects, then this is a real accomplishment. How much prevention you get depends on how bad off you are. The China study was really public health at its best. At the time we did the China study, people didn't know for certain whether folic acid by itself would prevent neural tube defects. We sent RJ off to China to do a large community intervention. He wound up showing some really fascinating things. We were asking uh, folks in the field, uh, the, the health providers that, that were in the villages, to take pictures of these babies in a way that we could then use the picture to make a diagnosis. Among the things that he showed was that how much prevention you get depends upon how high the incidence is when you put the folic acid into the population. And in parts of China, it went down almost 90%. And the China study was the first and only study that uh, showed that folic acid by itself, without other vitamins, prevents neural tube defects. And from that moment on, I knew that all we needed to do to keep tens of thousands of kids each year out of wheelchairs was to get every woman of reproductive age 400 micrograms of folic acid every day. We have lots of success stories about preventing spina bifida with folic acid fortification programs. And the key is you have to make it so that every manufacturer has to do it. So in the U.S., you know, it was prohibited uh, before February of 96, and then it was required 21 months later. And so beginning in 1990, uh, January 1, 1998, all enriched grains in the U.S. had to have folic acid in it. So once the folic acid was added to cereal grain products, added to the flour that goes into the bread that we eat and other cereal grain products, then you want to count how many cases of neural tube defects there were. It has resulted in a substantive reduction in the occurrence of neural tube defects among babies who have been born in the United States. There are roughly 300,000 cases of anencephaly and spina bifida around the world, and we're preventing someplace around about 15% uh, of that, so someplace on the word 20,000, 30,000 a year. And it's wonderful. I mean, thousands of kids don't have spina bifida and anencephaly. 
to have something so simple as folic acid in fortified foods that can prevent 50 to 70 percent of these children from having this condition and actually being born healthy to me is a success story beyond belief. Smallpox is gone, polio is on the way to being gone. I'd like for spina, spina bifida F to be the next one. And that to me is an exceptional thing to, to have happened and I have had the opportunity to be part of that. Tough not to be, tough not to be a, an evangelist for this, you know. Just a mere introduction into an amazing story. And here to share additional insights is Dr. Godfrey Oakley, Dr. R.J. Berry, Debbie Kowal, and D Dr. Dave Erickson. Thank you very much. Well, when you got up this morning, I bet you didn't know you were coming to hear an evangelist. <laughs> I'm proud to be an evangelist for, for prevention. And uh, I loved your remarks about the Zika work. I'm viewing it from the outside. It's just been marvelous to work to see the wonderful job the men and mostly women of CDC have done to promote and understand better about this. I'm holding the uh, Rasmussen uh, special report that was published in April. I think every public health student in the world should read this and see what a wonderful document was trying to put all the signs from every place you could get it to come to an important public health decision. Even if they made the wrong decision, it's a wonderful, wonderful view. And it looks like they got it right. <laughs> um, so my job is to try to put some context on this. Um, and uh, I think the first contextual slide is to remind people that birth defects kill babies. And what you see on this slide is what happened with infant mortality in terms of proportion of causes. And in the early years of the last century, diarrheas, uh, kill many babies as that became controlled. The proportion of deaths due to birth defects went up. The Gates Foundation has just rediscovered this slide in the work that's been done globally because it's being repeated in every single country as infant mortality has come down below 50, the leading cause of infant mortality becomes birth defects and, and, um, and prematurity. Those are the two things. That's the next 25 years of global public health. You heard it here first. Uh, <laughs> So the next context is when I was the second EIS officer in the, uh, in the birth defects program. And when I came, I would say we didn't have any idea about what caused spina bifida and anencephaly. We knew something about time, place, and person. But that really doesn't get you very far, does it? Somebody had to come up with the right idea. In the late 70s, that idea came up. And we thought there needed to be a randomized controlled trial. We worked to get one done in China. We'll tell you about that a bit. And now we sit on the stage and we know we can make this birth defect go away if we raise blood folate levels in women of reproductive age to the level that R.J. Berry tells us it needs, needs to be. That's just a wonderful progress. That which, uh, sorry, I forgot to change the slide, sorry. The one other thing in, in this slide is when I listened to the AIDS uh, uh, program, there was the early concern that half of the men died from their illness. Every baby dies from this illness. This is a 100% um, mortal uh, death-causing disease, and it definitely is. Um, so this is one of the, uh, this is what I call the great American epidemic of spina bifida and anencephaly. Uh, this was uh, Brian McMahon, who was the chairman of epidemiology at Harvard, had grown up in, in, in England where there was a lot of epidemiology done on neural tube defects and he knew it varied by time, space, and person. And he came with Stella Yen, his student, and they went through years and years worth of logbooks in the Boston Lying In and in the uh, Providence Lying In Hospital and reconstructed a major epidemic that nobody knew about. The title of the paper was Unrecognized Epidemic Spina Bifida and Anencephaly. And the reason for showing you this old slide is the world today is filled with unrecognized epidemics of spina bifida and anencephaly that folic acid will prevent. We just have to find them. And you can see it came down to 1960, around about two per thousand 
Uh, that's what it was when I came to work in 1968. And of course now in Atlanta we're down to a half per thousand. It's even 80% lower than what it was when I came to work here. RJ went to China, discovered, yes, there was a, an epidemic level that looked like the Boston level. It's up at uh, five, per, five uh, per thousand or 50 per 10,000. And of course, as I said in the video, the amount of prevention you get when you put folic acid in there depends upon how big the epidemic was before you, you put the intervention in. Now this slide, uh, the, blue, the red dots are uh, the levels of NTDs before fortification, and I ask you to concentrate on the dotted lines, which are the provinces of Canada. Within modern-day Canada in the 1990s, the incidence varied from 11 to 45, or in the terms of Boston, it would be the same level that we had in Boston was in, in Newfoundland. Newfoundland. And, uh, and that's, modern, that's a modern, modern country. Uh, it just shows this disease varies by the circumstances, and frankly, by blood folate levels is how it varies by, but we don't have the documentation to show that. And of course, the amount of prevention you get depends upon how bad you were when you got started. And so if you go into a country where there's a tenfold epidemic, like most of the developing world, India, a lot of Africa, so on, you have the potential of putting this single, paid for by the food industry, intervention in place that will reduce 90% of this birth defect and have an amazing impact almost instantaneously on the lives of, of families and, and kids and uh, reduce infant mortality too. This is our best guess at uh, where we are today. I got the idea from this map by looking at the polio map from 1998, so I've been drawing this map for a number of years, and you see we don't do as well yet as the polio people, but the green is good and the rest of it's not so good. Uh, and we now have prevented about 15%, and that's 25,000 kids a year. That's a wonderful accomplishment. But we've got another 200,000 to do, and we all are dedicated to trying to make that happen as rapidly as we can. We wouldn't be here today talking about spina bifida and folic acid if it weren't for Dick Smithles, professor of pediatrics from England, who had the eye, he knew that poor women had a high rate of these birth defects, and he thought nutrition might have something to do with it. And he stayed on that idea, and he stayed on that idea uh, until um, he did a, stu did a study of 1,000 women who'd previously had affected children. <clears throat> and half of those women took a multivitamin with folic acid in them uh, through before pregnancy, in the early weeks of pregnancy, and then the other group did not take the vitamins during that time. It showed an incredibly positive effect a seven-fold reduction, uh, but it wasn't randomized, and it wasn't randomized because the re ethical review committees wouldn't let him do a randomized controlled trial in 1970. It was a terrible error by those committees at those hospitals at that time, the latest by at least 10 years. Um, so um, what did we do with this? It wasn't randomized. Well, I wrote, uh, co-authored a letter to the Lancet that said, this is bunk, that, uh, that basically this is a uh, Selection bias, and don't worry your pretty little heads over this. Uh, we need to go doing a real study to figure out what's going on. I, I guess I ducked. I was wrong. I hope, I hope the guys that, uh, that the Sonia's paper turns out to be right as it looked like. I was dead wrong when we did this. But, you know, you make your mistakes. You see the data as best you can see them, and away you go. About that time, Brian McCarthy came to work in our group. Brian's a pretty smart guy. He loved China. He figured if he was going to get to work in China, he better get his boss interested in China. So he fiddles the way to get me to China. And I go to China uh, on a WHO uh, uh, review body for perinatal health. And I get there, and Brian sits me in front of a hospital logbook, and I do exactly what, what Yen and McMahon did. And I look through that logbook, and just sitting there that hour, I saw that we were in the midst of a huge epidemic of anencephaly and spina bifida that was totally unrecognized. Uh, Professor Yen is in this picture with me. What a lovely, wonderful woman. She had been trained in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Rockefeller hospitals in China. She spoke impeccable English. Nobody there could translate when we were there. She translated the whole five days herself for that meeting. And I say to her, well, what do you think? Could we do a randomized control trial here? It's very high risk. And in her wisdom, she said, it's a great idea if the politics will let us do it. And there were politics, as you will hear as we go along. I spent the 1980s hunting for money to do this study. 
Nobody was interested. The NIH wasn't interested. The March of Dimes wasn't interested. Fortunately, Nicholas Wall got money out of the MRC and began a randomized controlled trial. And the parents at the Spina Bifida Association of America were interested in finding the cause of spina bifida. And they were able to get to Senator Harkin, and Senator Harkin put a million dollars in the CDC budget to do this study. Once we knew it was coming, we had to plan for it. And if you don't notice anything else, the four guys there have on the same tie. <laughs> they, they, and, and RJ and Dave have his own, and they forgot to tell me. I didn't get the memo, so I didn't wear mine today. But that's, that's a picture of folic acid under a microscope that was marketed about the time we were doing this. And I bought thousands of them to give away, uh, but I forgot to wear mine this morning, OK? <laughs> so Dr. Li Zhu spent a year with us. We got to know him. Uh, and in the midst of this, Dave Erickson came into my office. And uh, if you don't know Dave, Dave's a rather quiet guy. You have to really listen to what he says, then come to his office, and this, it's important. And we're in there, and Dave says, gee, Godfrey, uh, this China thing, it's a high-risk venture. So I say to myself, well, what is, what, what's Dave really saying? And so I say, Dave, are you saying we should not do this? Oh, no, I didn't say that. I just said this is a high-risk venture. And like Dr. Fahey pointed out in his book on smallpox, there are lots of opportunities for these things to fail, and, you, and you're sort of lucky you get through all of them and actually get something done. So we're set to send RJ to, uh, to China in, in four days, and then that wonderful telephone call came. And um, here's the note I wrote on the scratch pad by the telephone. And you can see why I went to medical school, because you can't read my handwriting, but I'll, I'll help it with you, OK? So there's an R, R up there that says 0 0.28. That meant there was a 72% prevention. It was a randomized controlled trial. It had been a two by two design, so they knew it was just folic acid. But Nick had used 10 times the RDA as the dose. Now, don't tell Nick, but I think Nick used 10 times because he thought the study was going to be negative two, and he didn't want to be accused of not using a big enough dose. So he used a big dose. It complicated our lives for policy because you couldn't put 10 times the RDA in flour. So he wanted us, when we went off to China, to, um, to work on dose. And so here's, here's Sir, now Sir Nicholas Wall, who was talking about polypill at uh, Emory uh, several years later. And here's his study, which I just summarized for you. But the, uh, the, the real issue here that I think I wanted to point out is that we had this unique situation that we learned the cause of this birth defect and got the vaccine on the same day. Because folic acid will prevent all of this, and our whole effort has been and continues to be, how do we implement the policy that we know will make this disease go away? Um, so Dave, again, always on track, always seeing things I never saw and saving me forever, says to me, well, you know, RJ's going to get on the plane at the end of the week. Don't you think we ought to go talk to, uh, to Vern about this? Vern Houck was my boss. So I say, OK, so Dave and I get in the plane, go to the meeting, come into Vern's office, everybody's really grumpy. I'm really grumpy because I wouldn't tell the secretary what the agenda was because this was a pre-publication news I had. I didn't want to spread all over CDC. So I sat down, explained it to Vern. Vern listened carefully. He understood about randomized controlled trials and said, more or less, I don't understand why you came here. Send the boy to China. So we went back to the meeting and finished up the meeting, and RJ went to China, and you'll hear about that in a few minutes. So... Um, at the time we were sending RJ to, uh, to China, we were also working on the second uh, recommendation related to folic acid. And we had the first high-risk ones, which for women who previously had an affected child, but that wouldn't be enough because uh, only 5% of women had previously had an affected child. We needed a population recommendation. And so we did work on that, and we got that a year later. Uh, and it serves as policy basis for everybody in the world to know what needs to be done. And I think, Rick, is probably the most important MMWR article you ever published, okay? Uh, there might be some discussions on that, but any, I think, and of course we now know, and we didn't emphasize there, how much infant mortality around the world this will prevent. If we prevent this, we'll prevent 5 to 10 percent of infant mortality around the world with a single intervention paid for by the food companies. What's essential for success? As Feige pointed out, trust and persistence, which I forgot to put on the slide, but persistence. We had it, um, 
we eventually uh, went to China and decided to do a large community stu study to see if, we, if the recommendation we had assumed was right, uh, the dose of 400 micrograms was correct. Uh, and I'll, I'll end by just saying there was really one nice tidbit on delegation. You know, they're teaching these business courses, you have to delegate, you know. Well, I, this was completely delegated to RJ and, 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 and Dave and Li Zhu. They just did it. But they had me over there once to look around. I looked around a bit and I went up in this room and it's filled with what looked like shoe boxes. I sold shoes as a high school student. And this room is just filled with shoe boxes. What's in those shoe boxes? So they went and got one, pulled out an envelope, and in it were the 35 millimeter pictures for a baby that was born with a birth defect. And that room was filled with e pictures of every baby in the study that had birth defects. And so Cindy Moore could go there, sit in that room, and do the wonderful work that she did. It's my joy to invite R.J. Berry to the uh, podium here. Uh, as I said earlier, he was just a terrific, wonderful person to go there. Obviously took his family, his wife, Jane Seward, who is a distinguished epidemiologist that many of you know and have worked with. And one of his sons is a pediatric resident in, um, in Seattle. And I learned Sam is looking to go to nursing school. So it must be genetic. R.J. <laughs> Thank you, Godfrey. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to have uh, friends and family. And so I want to talk about my involvement uh, in China, which began 30 years ago. Um, I have uh, many people to uh, uh, thank for that. Um, my family went with me to China, and uh, so I had uh, four sons, and uh, it was quite exciting going out with four sons in in uh, uh, in China. This was a picture that was taken um, near the end of our stay there. So you see, you've seen this picture already uh, in the slide that Godfrey showed, and it was um, uh, it really captures the whole essence of the, of the effort between the Sino-American you know, Sino effort to uh, prevent neural tube defects. It was a cooperative project. Uh, we had um, uh, worked and you can see the, the, the sort of uh, village conditions that we were around. And it, it really uh, uh, it is, uh, tells uh, the story of this photo was that the mother had had a, a child with spina bifida and had run away, and that's why the only people in the photo photograph are the grandparents taking, holding, the, holding the child. Uh, as I already said, one of the, one of the, the uh, conditions that actually helped uh, us do, our, do the work was that this was the time of the one-child policy in China, and so anything that, that would uh, promote a good uh, pregnancy, healthy pregnancy, was something that would, you know, it was easy to get government support of that. So we had almost no uh, problems from uh, government uh, concern about why should we be doing this. And also they didn't, it was one other advantage that we had was that we were doing something that nobody there had ever done. So there was nobody at the higher levels to interfere with, oh, I, we should be doing it this way instead. So it, was, it was so new that nobody uh, was there to, uh, to uh, criticize us. So, so as I said, um, uh, Brian McCarthy's already been mentioned, but uh, in 1983 he went to China uh, to and uh, part of a risk approach project when he was assigned to WHO, and he set up a perinatal surveillance system in seven townships, a small population uh, for most birth, birth defect surveillance systems, and uh, and then was began teaching risk, uh, uh, the risk approach to people in China. And he invited me in 1986 to come and teach a course on uh, how to use ep uh, computers for epidemiology. And at this point, point most of the people, these, this is my first, cla this is my first uh, class to seven students, 
uh, some of them had never seen a computer before. And you notice we used to call these the luggables. They were the, the uh, compact computers that you could flip the screen off. They were very heavy, like 35 pounds or something. So it's a little different now with laptops. But that was, these were our, our uh, luggable uh, computers. Um, and the, the, the surveillance that was set up by, uh, by Brian and Li Ju and uh, was really imp provided very, very critical information for us. Uh, as you can see on the slide that um, the perinatal mortality was, you know, 25 per, per thousand and 5 per thousand of that was due to neural tube defects. So this is population based and this was you know, this was the, the gold standard in terms of we knew that there were NTDs there and that, that was not a question when we were started planning uh, the project. Uh, one point of this that, that uh, later I'll introduce uh, Deborah Cole. Uh, she is uh, uh, a co-author on this report with uh, Brian McCarthy and, and Lee Ju. So we had many, uh, over the next couple of years, we had a lot of work um, uh, trying to you know, write the protocol. As, as Godfrey said, Lee Ju was, was here in Atlanta uh, living uh, with, with, with Brian. And it had, um, it was a, a real, uh, he was trying to translate the, the Chinese situation into what, what could we, how could we actually do a, a clinical trial. We were going to randomize by village, not by individuals. And uh, so there were a lot of uh, new, new things that, that we were doing. It sort of culminated in this meeting in May of 1990 at, uh, in Beijing. And we were, very, we were going to do a randomized trial, and we wanted to be really sure that people really understood what that was and not try to um, um, you know, hide anything from, from, the, from the, uh, the officials in China. And so we were talking about um, uh, how, how to, to do that. Um, this is a picture of Li Ju and me uh, conducting training. We were, I was giving a lecture on um, the operations of a, of, of, of a clinical trial, and Li Zhu was translating. I was speaking uh, for 15 to 20 seconds, and then Li Zhu would talk for two minutes. <laughs> and we had really great support from the, from the embassy. This woman was the science and technology officer at the, at the embassy who was very involved. She was, had been born in Malaysia and was absolutely fluent in Chinese. And uh, during one of our breaks, she said to me, you know, RJ, I'm learning a lot more about this from Li Zhu than I am from you. <laughs> and I said, well, of course. <laughs> There's nobody who, 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 who that needs to hear it, the English version of this talk. People here need to hear the Chinese version of the talk. And so Li Zhu knew exactly how to how to organize that. So what ensued was a whole series of many, many meetings. We, we worked in, in the end, uh, 21 counties. That was about 900 townships. The overall population was about 16, 16 million people. Uh, and we had uh, countless meetings like this with local officials and having um, Tea and snacks and lots of you know lots of uh, talks from the hospital administrators and things and I asked lots and lots of questions. Later, Li Ju told me that uh, he had uh, been able to write the operations manual because I could go in there and ask those questions, and he actually couldn't do that. So by uh, all of the the uh, the questioning that I had done, it enabled them to. To, uh, to do that. So we had to, and we spent a lot of time uh, talking to people, explaining things. Uh, this is uh, Li Ju and me with uh, a villager uh, 
that, that was taken at, at the time of that other uh, at that other photo, and it was um, um, it was often it was oftentimes you know difficult conditions. Um, all almost all the counties we worked in were closed counties at that time. Many times counties were closed because um, they were um, secret. Something was going on that was secret there, but in most of them, it was because they didn't have facilities that they thought were uh, up to the standard for a, for a foreigner to stay in. And so I stayed in some places that were really pretty marginal. One one uh, hotel where we had our one of our first trainings was uh, it was in November before people were allowed to heat. So I spent the entire day in November with frost on my breast in the meeting room, and they had no heat in the, in the hotel the entire time, and um, I had hot water two hours in the evening so I could have a, a warm bath. Um, but all of this effort ended, you know, um, with uh, we had a big steering group meeting in, um, in June of 1990, um, the, there are, I won't go through some, in, some of the names, but there are many people there, people who are uh, more senior here, I guess, will recognize it. This is the old CDC uh, Building 1. Uh, and we also then had a meeting in, uh, in Beijing on, in March of 1991. I will point out the, um, the I can't, there's a, a, the woman, the young woman, it's second from the right in this in this picture is Irene Yen. Uh, she and I were the uh, first people who were. I was told that we were the first CDC employees ever assigned overseas as CDC employees. Before that time, they had all been assigned as WHO or UNICEF or USAID or some other things. But we we were the first to go through the NSDD 38. You know, circular 175, all those, those sorts of things that people have to do. So I was the CDC office of one in, in China. Um, and we put an enormous effort into educational materials. You know, we had different pamphlets for couples, for, for in-laws, in for uh, county officials, for um, uh, health workers. Uh, and so there were posters, we had TV spots, uh, and a lot of things that uh, were, uh, took a lot of work and uh, were very, very, very important. One of the, th one of the things that we did was all, that was, I think we were the first people to submit a video script to the CDC IRB uh, as the informed consent. And so we had uh, a video that was produced in China that was um, that would inform the couples of what we were trying to do, and then so this is a picture of um, people, a couple sitting, watching the informed consent, and then they would be asked for their permission after after seeing this video. We also developed a, what we call the Red Book. Uh, it was a perinatal care booklet. It was um, it was all set for computer data entry, we had to teach people how to use computers, how to do data entry and clean and checking, so there was an enormous amount of um, effort put into this. Here's a, here's a room with racks of red book. Godfrey was talking about rooms full of boxes, uh, red boxes. Well, it was, a, it was a great effort on our part to um, get people to, to store these booklets by numerical order. They wanted to store them, in the, you know, traditionally they would have stored them in bundles of, of uh, booklets by township, by village, or month, and things like that. And it was, they could find things, but it was really difficult. So convincing them to use a completely different system of numerical order was, was, a, was a, a big, big effort. Um, and for birth defects, the surveillance, you've heard a little bit about that, but we had to uh, develop a, a birth defects atlas, and we managed to find pictures of 
Chinese babies with, with birth defects uh, and uh, distributed this throughout the, the project areas. Um, and we had, as, as you saw in the video in the beginning, uh, Dr. C uh, Cindy Moore was talking about the photos. Uh, and we went to an enormous effort uh, in, in doing that. And we bought uh, cameras, flashes, uh, had trainings on how to take photos, you know, what views to take. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side here, you can see uh, Dr. Moore and two pediatricians in China. And here's one of the red boxes Godfrey was talking about that's uh, filled with uh, photos of, um, uh, of every birth defect that we could get photos of. I think there are about 45,000 photos that we now have. And one of the most important things that we did was send data back to the local areas. We had monthly reports on, on uh, pill taking and, and we could send back, we could find errors quickly. We had, these were quarterly reports that we sent back. And so it, it was a, a very uh, a new approach for them. Most people had never seen data come back down the, the pike. Everything gets sent up and then nothing ever comes back. So they were, uh, it, that took some getting used to as well. Some of the cultural differences were also difficult for us to get used to. Um, the, the, the Chinese uh, are very, have uh, many more graphic posters related to health. Uh, and this was an example of a pair of posters that um, we, the tree, you know, the, the, the tree of life on the left-hand side is the green one with healthy, happy children. On the right-hand side are pictures of children with uh, neural, neural, neural tube defects. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, you wouldn't see this sort of poster in the U.S., that, that would, uh, but this was a, a very common, uh, common occurrence. Um, we also had been, the, the, I guess, the one project in China. Any time the director of CDC came to China, they visited us, and so this is Dr. Roper, who was um, the director in the beginning of the project uh, on the Great Wall. And then in uh, 1996, this is Dr. Satcher with Godfrey, uh, Dave Erickson, Lee Ju, and uh, Dick Jackson. So this was something that we had a lot uh, of, of cooperation from the office of the director. Uh, we also had uh, the the photo I showed earlier of the Memorandum of Understanding signing in 1991. We had to renew that in 1998, and that coincided with the visit of President Clinton and, uh, and, and Mrs. Clinton uh, to, to China, and they visited uh, the, the university, um, and we signed a, an intent to collaborate in 1998. Uh, that was um, uh, very important. Um, I was well taken care of in China. Uh, I was nominated for Friendship Award. I, got, uh, I was awarded the, the Friendship Award in 1994 uh, and because of the work that, that so many other people had done. Uh, and so I was very, uh, very pleased to have that happen. Um, but I want to say that you know, I think that I've talked about a lot of different things. Um, happening in China, uh, but Dr. Li Ju is the person who I think was the most important person in the, uh, in the whole collaboration. He was the person who was able to uh, take the ideas, tra translate them into uh, operations. We, we had a group, a group of people, small group of people from, from, the, from the U.S. side, small group of people from the Chinese side. We would meet, decide what needed to be done. They would go off and work with their, with their side. We would, we would go and work with, with our side. And that was a very efficient way of approaching all of these uh, situations. And as Godfrey said, we had trust and we uh, really worked, worked well together. Um, and I have so many people to thank for uh, all this work from my family to all the people. I'm, I see a lot of people in this room who worked on the project in the past. 
Every, you know, people have, have put in so much time and energy into this. Um, this is a, a book. I, I didn't bring it up. This is a book that um, Lee Ju uh, made. It has the names of the names of all 16,000 people who put some time in, into working on the project at that time. And the final uh, paper had about almost 250,000 women who, who participated. And I am very pleased now to uh, introduce Debbie Kowal. She wrote this book about the uh, uh, entire evolution of, the, of, of this project. And uh, well. well, thank you, RJ. So about 10 years after the last woman was enrolled in the study, Li Zhu asked me if I might be interested in writing a book about the lessons learned. So I spoke with Li Zhu and RJ and Godfrey and about 40 others, both here at CDC and in China. And I was struck by the adventure of it all. The trajectory of this study has all the elements of a great story because it succeeded against so many odds. Now this great story was bookended by conflicts involving tanks and bombs. At one end, in 1989, there was this confrontation in Tiananmen Square. And at the other end, about a decade later, US military jets dropped bombs on the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. And it took a while to convince the Chinese that this was an accident. In between those explosive bookends were multiple and surprising challenges. And you've heard a number of them from RJ and Godfrey. But let me focus on what they already knew from the get-go. They knew there would be pressure for having to stretch what was never enough funding to cover this massive study, nor enough elasticity to the deadlines. In addition, they had to figure out how to work in a nation that had for decades been hostile and closed to the United States and the rest of the world. They knew very little about it. And at the beginning, the teams found itself confronted by allegations that they were about to partner with a Chinese research culture that could not be trusted. While in China, the Chinese officials and authorities mistrusted the CDC intentions. Why did the Americans want to come and co conduct experiments, maybe just like the Japanese did at, during World War II, on their people? It was also hard to track down professionals to staff the offices in Beijing. They had been widely scattered by the C Cultural Revolution and a nation without any phone directories, no internet, and virtually no computers other than what RJ had brought over. And how do you educate hundreds of thousands of workers and women in this abstract notion of volunteerism, a concept foreign to individuals living under a totalitarian regime? What made this study work Godfrey had already uh, alluded to, sheer perseverance. Li Zhu said the other thing that made this study work was getting the right people. Okay, so all of those who were leading this study were smart, they had the right expertise, they were passionate about preventing birth defects and spina bifida, but each brought more to the table. It can't have a full accounting in this brief presentation, but just a few examples here. Godfrey Oakley. Anyone who knows him will tell you that he can be relentless in his pursuits. <laughs> so as he scrounged for money and support, Godfrey worked doggedly 
to the point of digging under the fence to find bones in other yards. Dave Erickson, um, in contrast to Godfrey, was a little bit more um, reticent kind of individual. But he battled skeptics who questioned the very ethics of this study. He insisted without the right study design, you couldn't have results that could be trusted. And therefore, that indeed what was be, would be unethical. He championed scientific integrity. RJ is meticulous. But I'm going to let his Chinese colleagues and students share what they had to say to him. They said he was a model of hard work, of teamwork, of listening to and being patient with people, and of the heart. They cried when he moved back to Atlanta. And then there's Li Zhu. As RJ said, and Godfrey, he was a linchpin to this collaboration. And he also made good relationships with very powerful people in the Chinese government who would have to make a choice about whether they would help or hinder this study. I want to give you a little background about our, uh, uh, Li Zhu. When he was a child, he and his family were exiled to Burma, thrown out of the country. He came back as a young man, graduated from medical school, only to be exiled again during the Cultural Revolution, sent to remote Gansu province, where he, despite having no relevant experience whatsoever, was expected to rebuild the crumbling uh, public health system including the sanitation system. So Li Zhu worked side by side with farmers, doing things like digging latrines. He likes to say that he built his public health knowledge from the ground up. <laughs> so he had rough experiences. But his rough experiences really taught him how to adapt, to improvise, and to overcome a slogan so apt that I just had to steal it from the U.S. Marines and that I feel also apply to all the individuals sitting at this panel, sitting out in the audience as well, who had been involved in this study. Now, this study shows some of the local leaders um, from one of the many project sites. These were from Jiaxing City, uh, City near Shanghai, and in it are uh, Dr. Mu and Dr. Tong from the Health Bureau, Madam Fan, the uh, vice mayor. Uh, the young woman is Liu Jingjing, my interpreter, and also my volunteer drinker. Anyone who's ever been the guest of honor at a Chinese banquet and who has to be toasted will understand just how valuable she was to me. So local leaders such as uh, these uh, fulfilled Li Zhu's other reason for why this study worked. They built relationships that could foster collaboration. Just one example. At one point, um, the local authorities in these many multiple sites uh, threatened to pull out, to have a mutiny. They felt that they were sacrificing Unreason unreasonable amounts of their own budget and their own workforce without getting a whole lot of benefit in return. But Madame Fan and her team and Li Zhu had been investing a great deal of time in developing some meaningful relationships with these individuals. They developed trust. It's called guanxi in China. It took a lot of talk but they eventually just asked them to trust them when they said that eventually there would be benefits that actually would be more valuable and more sustaining than the money and vehicles they were, had been demanding. Again, it was Guanxi that helped all of this collaboration and helped save the day at this particular uh, very con <laughs> filled with conflict meeting. Now, this photo uh, shows uh, the, some of the supervisory staff, also in Jossing City. 
They supervise data collectors, healthcare staff, and field workers. As one of the quality improvement uh, teams, the researchers organized at each of the local levels, they would meet regularly to solve the local problems. So many, maybe one township had um, only one motorcycle and no other vehicle to go collect data or to transport laboring women to the hospital where they were required to deliver as part of this study. Um, what do they do? Personnel problems, all of you know, those are universal. They had to be solved as well. Now, I snapped this photo in 2005, years after the study ended. And half the people you see in this photo have been retired. But here they are. They're still showing up so many years later because they want to help solve their community's problems together. Now looking back, these individuals say, as well as the others that I spoke to, that because of their involvement in this study, the expertise of their personnel increased, record keeping, patient follow up, and quality control in general improved, and because MCH services were built up to support the study subjects, those services became broader and better and remained so. Here are some of the epidemiologists from the Beijing office on a lunchtime stroll with uh, Li Zhu. And most worked in the study when they were inexperienced new graduates or students. Yet today, they're respected professionals paying it forward, providing CDC-style uh, consultation and training to others in China and in other nations. And um, this infrastructure of public health expertise is a collateral but sustaining measure of success of this study. And so were the rewards that were given to and promised to those local leaders. Education and training for their workforce, an infrastructure that could continue uh, to support activities beyond those of the study, and of course, the spirit and practice of collaboration. So it seems to me that the story of this study hasn't yet ended. So I am uh, honored to develop, to um, introduce uh, and develop Dave Erickson. Uh, you've already heard a little bit about him. He had uh, supervised uh, some of the work when it was being done in China. He was also one of the first to uh, conduct surveillance on uh, these birth defects. And when I asked him, Dave, how do you want me to introduce you? He said, retired. <laughs> well, all right, I'm saying that, David, but I do want to point out, remember that slide where I showed you where everybody, half the people there were retired, but they're still showing up? Well, that definitely describes Dave. He's still showing up. <laughs> Dave? My remarks here uh, are to describe how the design of the China study was influenced by the evolving epidemiological data on the association between folic acid and neural tube defects, anencephaly, and spina bifida. I'll begin by taking a moment to familiarize you with the arrangement of the information on the screen. Uh, well, here we go. The results from 11 studies are arranged on the left uh, by year of publication. Uh, there are 11 studies here, and the 12th entry on the list is the China study. The first study from England, which you heard a good bit about from Godfrey, was published in 1980 in the study of Smithles and his colleagues. and. Uh, the participants were high-risk women who had earlier pregnancy affected by a neural tube defect. Studies of these high-risk women are often called recurrent studies. There are four of these studies here in this 
listed, and they are designated by an R in the column just to the left of the vertical axis of this graph. The horizontal axis is marked in risk ratios ranging from 0 to 2.6, and the dotted vertical line shows a risk ratio of 1. The intervention given by Smithles was a daily dose of 360 micrograms of folic acid plus a multivitamin. The treatment group rate was very low compared to that among women who did not present for prenatal care early enough to start using a vitamin treatment before conception. <coughs> However, there was no placebo or other control regimen, and there was no randomization of treatment. The Smithles, as Godfrey pointed out, the Smithles research team had wanted to conduct a study with randomization, but was prevented from doing so by their local research ethics committee. I agree with Godfrey's assessment of that, that that was very unfortunate. So this, despite the substantial uncertainty resulting from the lack of a randomized approach, the, the study generated a lot of excitement over the possibility of the prevention of these serious birth defects, neural tube defects, with a simple and un, inexpensive <coughs> regimen. And at the same time, there was intense skepticism in certain quarters that a, a belief that the result must be due to biases and confounding. It's not surprising, because everyone knew at that time in time that vitamin pills did nothing but make expensive urine. <laughs> the next study to come along was a uh, double-blind, randomized study of 4,000 microgram folic acid pills. It showed a reduced risk, but the study was far too small, just a couple of hundred, couple of hundred pregnancies. It's far too small to be conclusive. The contrast of the doses of folic acid used in these two studies, 360 micrograms and 4,000 micrograms, presaged a, a, a discussions that continue today about the effectiveness of low-dose versus high-dose vitamin supplements. As you heard earlier, there's a rather general feeling at the time that a properly randomized study was needed. However, the next three studies to come along were case control studies. And these were uh, easier to do and less expensive to do. They could be done. The first one uh, out, of, out of the starting blocks was the Atlanta study that Joe Molinaire mentioned, a, a study which we made use of data to collect it primarily for issues of uh, risks of Vietnam veterans for fathering babies with birth defects. Uh, these and the other studies were largely based on the use of dietary supplements containing low doses of folic acid, often 400 micrograms, uh, or on estimates of natural food folate intake. The Atlanta CDC study and the Australian study showed significant reductions in risks, whereas the California NIH study showed none. I believe this disparity was viewed as a positive for the NIH study in general and a negative for the CDC study. I think it militated against the development uh, and funding of a randomized trial of first occurrences in the U.S. A study in Boston collected information on multivitamin and folic acid use prior to and after conception from women having a alpha fetoprotein screening or amniocentesis. The study had a prospective outlook, but because the vitamin use information was collected before the NTD status of the pregnancy was known. It was a good study, potentially free of many of the biases of the case control approach to studies. And it did make a bit of a dent in the prevalent suspicion that the apparent protective effect of folic acid was a mirage generated by the observational study flaws. But it was clear that blinded and randomized studies were needed if the promises of prevention were ever to be confirmed and turned into public health action. A well-designed RCT, uh, high-dose folic acid uh, in women with a history of earlier NTD pregnancies was underway in the United Kingdom. It didn't make sense 
to duplicate a recurrence prevention study in the U.S. Besides, many observers felt that an unequivocal positive result from a, another high-dose study might not provide impotence for public health action, especially when the effect of low dose was suggested by the observational studies. In addition, there was a randomized study of first NTD occurrence prevention underway in Hungary, but it was viewed as too small to provide useful information in a timely way. The north of China, with its very high rates of neural tube defect, as high as 1% in some areas, beckoned as a potential ideal place to undertake an RCT of folic acid effects in the general population. From the talks you just heard, there was a lot uh, of efforts going on to design and undertake a good RCT in China. And then, well, just sort of unexpectedly, almost out of the blue, in, in the midst of this preparatory work in China, between uh, CDC and, and Beijing Medical University staffers, the UK MRC um, trial of multivitamins and high-dose folic acid was stopped because of the finding of a strong protective effect, a protective effect of folic acid alone. This resulted in the abandonment of the planned RCT in China uh, for ethical reasons. And then not long afterwards, contrary to expectations, the Hungarian RCT of multivitamins with a mid-dose level of folic acid was stopped because of a significant positive preventive effect based on small numbers. It was an important study, but in a sense it was a, a lucky finding from a statistical point of view. An interval of discussions ensued in the US and China. In the end, the decision was to morph the China RCT into a community intervention of 4,000 micrograms folic acid and to pair it with an evaluation of the efficacy of low-dose folic acid without other vitamins. The high rates of NTD in the north and the technical expertise developed in Beijing made it a very good place to assess the, further the NTD preventive effect of low dose, 400 micrograms of folic acid alone. And at the end, the results gave strong support to the earlier United States Public Health Service 1992 recommendation that all women capable of becoming pregnant should consume daily 400 micrograms of folic acid on a continuous and ongoing basis specifically to reduce their risk of having a pregnancy affected by spina bifida or anencephaly. And it did that in spades. Um, so, uh, I see a lot of faces out there, or did earlier, it's a little hard to see you all right at the moment, but appreciate your being here. It's been a, a wonderful, it was a wonderful trip for me, um, working with RJ, um, probably couldn't have, rub two nickels together out there without RJ on place and many other people here too. Uh, thank you, God, for your, for your support over the years. To Debbie for letting us know what happened along the way. Thank you for your attention. congratulate you on terrific work and thank you for documenting it and sharing the, the lessons and process with us, which are fascinating. I'd like you to reflect on the unfinished business as you look at the world now. First, um, the, the data strongly suggests that some irreducible minimum is there, whether it's because of biological factors relating to folate or something else. Uh, what do we know about the, the, the other 20 to 30 percent? And second, globally, uh, you highlighted that we're only preventing a certain proportion of what we could prevent. What are the barriers, and how could we try to, to reduce those? So I'll take the, the first pass at that. Um, the 20% um, that we are the 
0.5 per thousand, we simply don't know. There's a drug called valproic acid that causes it. If you have maternal diabetes insulin dependent, you increase the risk by five-fold. And there's all sorts of searches for other things. Uh, it pales a bit, besides what we know to do, that we aren't doing. And I would say that the most important impediment right now is the global burden of disease analysis. I've been in constant discussion with people at the Gates Foundation as recently as yesterday with emails where they simply do not believe that the rate of spina bifida and anencephaly in India could be five per thousand, which it wasn't. I showed you many examples around the world where that was. RJ found it when he went to China. There isn't any question. There's something deadly wrong with the global burden of disease uh, counting of babies with birth defects. And until they get over that, they're not going to put any money into this. Now, just in the last two weeks, they have decided to appoint a panel of people that will seek to answer the question, is folic acid preventable spina bifida a global public health problem? Yes, completely obvious. But for some reason, the people there have got to go through this exercise. And RJ is involved in talking to that panel next Monday or Tuesday, and hopefully he'll tell the story in a way they can, can get it. But that to me is just, I mean, one of my really good friends went there, who's a geneticist, knows this. I told him the story three years ago. I expect him to write me a big check, and we'd set up something at the CDC task force, and we'd make this go away while you guys couldn't get the money out of the Congress. And all of a sudden, duh, nothing was happening. And what I found out when we presented to him a summer ago was they don't believe the numbers. And so we keep writing the numbers, and we have a paper that we can't quite get published that we hope, hope, hope shows that. So I think that's it. And, and I think the other thing is that um, this needs to be viewed as a birth defects prevention problem, not a nutrition problem. And I think that the lesson from the immunization people, I just think it's just golden. They set a prize. They set a goal. We're going to make this go away. And then we figure out along the way what it is we have to do to achieve that goal. And, of course, Bill Feige tells the story of... Uh, he was afraid to ask Dave Sensor for anything because Dave sent him everything. And I know you haven't had the capability with this Congress in order to do that kind of re resources to uh, build a global program to prevent this. Uh, I know that you have done rubella, and that's wonderful. Uh, this is about twice as many babies as congenital rubella syndrome a year and, and really needs to be done if we can find the money someplace to do it. So hunting for money again. Oh, thank you. Uh, speaking as a chemist, uh, these results are truly remarkable. Could one of you talk briefly about the physiological or biochemical reasons that folic acid works? Uh, that's, that's really easy. We don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the one carbon cycle where all of the action occurs is involved with um, you know, the, the, the operation of every cell in the body. And we know that folic acid given to, to women at the right point, right time, uh, and will prevent, you know, the uh, neural tube defects. Uh, but uh, there, I, I looked Recently, in Scopus, there are 60,000 papers that uh, are found with folic acid, and there, since about 2003, there's a, about 2,000 a year, and a lot of them are about the mechanism. I mean, there are people working on all different kinds of models. There, there is no answer yet, um, but people are working hard on it, but we do not know the actual physiological mechanism by which uh, folic acid prevents. So I'm going to weigh in on that just a bit. Uh, of course, I think it's a bit simpler than that. Um, and the, the really wonderful thing about this for epidemiologists is we figured out, and we know how to make this disease go away by the boys and girls being funded by NIH to find the mechanism ain't found it yet. 
And that's a really reason, the reason we love epidemiology uh, because we can find out how to do it. We, like, like polio, I mean like uh, smallpox. We knew how to do it before we knew there were viruses. My goodness, what wonderful things epidemiologists do. Well, we know from medical school that you get, you get folate deficiency anemia because you can't make red cells. And the reason you can't make red cells is you need three of the four base pairs that make DNA and you cannot make those without folic acid. What well, basically what happens if you don't have enough folic acid, you stop the production of DNA of, of the cells, and therefore that's likely to be the mechanism. There's another potential mechanism that uh, I'm not betting on, but R.J. must think still is equal. I don't think it's equal. I think it's pretty clear we've known about folate deficiency anemia. And by the way, we didn't say this today, but folic acid fortification in the United States has eliminated folate deficiency anemia. It doesn't exist in all the hospitals where the alcoholics used to have it. It doesn't exist anymore because it went away. And there's exciting RCT data from China that suggests that in a large randomized control trial, it will prevent about 50% of first ischemic strokes of those in the bottom half of the folates. It's just sitting there to be done and everybody's not paying attention to it. Could you comment on what China decided to do? I don't, I'm not familiar with whether they're um, providing folic acid um, pills or whether they went with grain suppl supplementation or what, what's their, what was their response to the landmark work? The, um, <laughs> the, it's all been caught up in politics. Uh, there was uh, one woman who thought that uh, potato blight was the cause of it for a long time, and in 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 the, in the, the, the nutrition uh, department, so that 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 slowed things down. There was an effort in the 19 uh, early 2000s to fortify, and very very, it looked like the the right person, high high level uh, in the planning commission of China was going to do that. Um, and then that effort stopped for reasons that I don't know why. Um, it, we, in 2005, we had a, um, a, a meeting in China of international birth defects and uh, disabilities prevention. Out of that came a manifesto that the Chinese government adopted and pushed through the D WHO um, uh, World Health Assembly, and th that and there was a 2009 uh, declaration for for surveillance and to uh, uh, use folic acid, and the Chinese at that time uh, took the action to start to give away pills to women uh, from the poorer areas of the country, and a lot of the areas that were the wealthy areas, the the governments, their local governments decided to actually do the same thing, and so that's an ongoing uh, effort. Uh, I, I'm concerned that that's, they're not getting to women quickly enough. If you don't have, get it within the first uh, 28 days of pregnancy, then you prob it's probably not going to be effective. So, but that's, that's where the current status is. There, there are uh, 20 or 30,000 you know, mills in, in China, local mills. So it, 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 there, there are lots of challenges in trying to develop uh, fortification. And some areas are mostly rice. So it, it's a, it, it, it mirrors the problems that are else, uh, many, many other places in the world. I think one of the conundrums is that the evidence was so solid. It was randomized control trial evidence, and our FDA, off the record, were not very helpful. It took an enormous political process done by the March of Dimes to finally get fortification done in the U.S., and I bring that up not to be critical of the FDA, but to remind you that in every country, like Walt Dowdle said on this stage in one of the earlier programs, that public health is political. And it's creating the political will, and that takes many different ways depending upon which country you're in right now. In Ukraine, three days ago, they had a four-minute video showing it uh, uh, that how wonderful it would be to do fortification. They still haven't done it there. So you don't know what it takes. It's various and sundry different country by country. And to me, that's what needs to be funded is a group of people like the people at CDC that care about smallpox and making it go away or caring about polio and making it go away. There needs to be stable funding for a group of people who want to make this disease to go away and, uh, and supply them 
with the tools, and it's really three things. One is to do advocacy-based, science-based advocacy work so that the governments require folic acid fortification wherever it can be done. You have to have the mill, you have to teach the millers how to put folic acid in the flour, which your grandmother can almost do, but it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, and the governments have to regulate it. That's our problem in Africa now. There are regulations to put it in flour, but the corruption is so that it is not being put in flour, and we have to figure out how to teach and support the governments to be able to fortify. And then finally, we need to track and make sure we're continuing to do the prevention, which I think there are two really ways to do that, and CDC has just been pioneers at doing this. One is getting, we now have a biological marker for what the, what the population Plasma folate level needs to be of every woman of reproductive age. It's about 1,000, whatever the units are, for RBC. And RJ knows it backwards and forwards and Krista Crider. We, we've got that, and WHO has, has, has accepted those. And, of course, we need to put a face, continue to put a face on this where we can. We need to be counting babies with spina bifida um, and, and anencephaly and showing that we've made that reduction. But... I made it a parents international conference two weeks ago, the idea, the statement, we don't need any more research to make this birth defect go away. What we need is the political will and the money to support the people to raise that political will to get this job done, and then we'll get it done. In the meantime, it's just going to poop along, and retirees like me in my spare time are trying to you know, raise a little help from here or there. <laughs> Brian? First a comment and then a question. The comment is <clears throat> that there was an incredible environment within China at the time that enabled and both demanded and enabled accounting for every pregnancy, not just live birth. That's number one. <clears throat> and that empowered the environment that enabled the count to be correct. Now, I might not have agreed with walking into a <clears throat> barefoot doctor's hut and having the menstrual cycle history of every woman in the village on the blackboard for the reason that they were doing it, but the concept of driving quality and improvement through the count needs to be recognized and that CDC doesn't stand for Centers for Disease Control, it stands for Count, Divide, and Compare. <laughs> and that's Alex Langmuir, by the way, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and he brought it up in my presentation at EIS. <clears throat> the, the, the question is, <clears throat> and I'm serious about this, is why isn't the lack of fortification with folic acid being defined as public health malpractice? I, I didn't plant that, honest. <laughs> it, but I did write it in the BMJ about 10 years ago, uh, and it absolutely is. Um, the worst form of public health malpractice I can think of, and the people who are standing in the way. Like not, one, comp, one comparison I like to make is that the, the new uh, vaccine for homophilus, I forgot what the buzzword is for it, but the, what's it called? Pentab well, no, the, the conjugate is the word I'm looking for. It came available the same time we got this. And within, you know, four years, almost every, it would be malpractice to have a kid show up with meningococcal, I mean, uh, hemophilus meningitis, you know. And, and yet we, we put up with this. Now, in the U.S., we're in good shape. It's almost gone here. We're just like polio. We're very, we don't, having trouble defining exactly when we're gone. But in my view, we're very close to being gone, which gives us the science to know we can make it go away other places. I, I just want to make the observation that what you describe as, uh, appro as an approach is very similar to a whole host of other things where we have a clear technical basis to act. There's a need for groups outside of the government to push the government. There's a need for the government to do the right thing. And then there's a need to implement. And there's finally the critical component of where are the incentives. With HIB, you have incentives of manufacturers to get a life-saving product out there. 
With here, you have negative incentives for many of the manufacturers unless they can get a kind of uh, uh, a benefit from calling it fortified and then people like it and then they can charge a little bit more and at least recoup their costs. But I think we have to be um, open-eyed about what the limitations on our actions are. But your delineation of what needs to be done, not only is I'm certain correct for this, it's a general uh, approach to how we try to get things done. And the difference between the infectious and the non-infectious diseases generally is that the infectious diseases don't usually have a lobby associated with them. Well, they have the vaccine industrial complex yes. that works just exactly like a charm. Everybody knows what they're supposed to do, you know. The vaccine committee works, the blah, 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 it works. And the, but in the, in, in the nutrition world or the vitamin world, there's a lot of fussing back and forth. I, I take one objection to one thing that you said, and that is that with f folic acid fortification, we don't want it to be done as a, a more expensive product. We need to make this like clean drinking water because it's been shown in Australia, where we did it in Australia, the people who got the most benefit were the aboriginals who had a threefold increased risk to begin with. They got it also. This, this is, needs to be as egalitarian as it can be, and as soon as you put it into a market environment, you lose. And the way you solve that problem, what the, what the manufacturers are afraid of is that they'll have to pay for it. And so what you do is you just say everybody has to pay for it, and it costs one cent per capita per year. Cost nothing. Every manufacturer in any situation in the world can cover this. All we have to do is to get somebody to say, yep, we're going to do it. No. No, thank you very much for your, your comments and for the presentation and uh, for sharing your insights. Um, I'd ask the audience to please join me in thanking the speakers for their time and for sharing their knowledge. I, I have a few more thank yous. I would like to also uh, take a moment to thank everybody in the audience and everybody who is watching. Uh, I know many of you worked in this area and uh, many of you continue to work in this area. So thank you very much for your devotion to this very important public health issue. Thank you. <laughs> and, and then lastly, I'm gonna thank the MMWR and um, I would encourage you go, to go down to the um, CDC library to see RJ's personal collection from the folate items. And then lastly, the museum has a very interesting exhibit at 1230 today on the photos from CDC. Thank you.